Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Wise Decision Maker Show, where we help you make the wisest and most profitable decisions. My name is Dr. Gleb Sapurski. I'm the CEO of Disaster Avoidance Experts, the future of work consultancy that sponsors the Wise Decision Maker Show. And I'm joined today by Miles. Miles, can you please introduce yourself and share a little bit about what you do? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Hello, everyone. I'm Miles Everson. I'm the CEO of MBO Partners. MBO Partners is the largest platform for independent knowledge workers that are high-end knowledge workers. And so we get the luxury of helping people that want to run an independent business, operate as an independent, and do work with big enterprises. Excellent. And generative AI, of course, is widely in the news. What have you seen as the impact of generative AI on independent workers in particular? Yeah, so, you know, it's it's a timely discussion for us, Dr. Gleb, because we just did some recent uh, surveying mm -hmm. with, for independents and how they felt about generative AI. Um, and for the most part, the independent workers are kind of emerging candidly as fearless and proactive. Um, mm -hmm. Only 8% of them said that they foresee the work facing immediate replacement by generative AI um, over the next five years, which was higher than what we saw from the full-time workforce. Because mm -hmm. um, in the full-time workforce, it was 13% said that they saw it replacing their work, right? Now that may be because our workers are um, higher end independent mm -hmm. workers where um, you know, part of what I, I think about when you think about AI generally, and certainly the case with generative AI, is when when you have a decisioning or that needs to occur where there's unstructured data and um, it's judgmental decisions, mm -hmm. the, the AI has not quite been trained yet to be as effective as it is when it's structured data and structured sure. decisioning. And so a lot of the entrepreneurs on our platform are in that first category. So I think mm. that's maybe why they're less concerned about it. Mm -hmm. um, if I can make another point on here, what's interesting is 37% of them actually felt that they could incorporate the use mm -hmm. of generative AI and the delivery of their mm. services to their end clients. So in many respects, they see it as a positive because it's going to help them get some of more of, I'll say, the rudimentary research analysis done mm -hmm. that normally is done by um, less experienced professionals, let's say, mm -hmm. because they're going to be able to leverage generative AI to make themselves more valuable to their end clients. So mm -hmm. so we were we were quite um, you know, pleased, I'll say, with the way they're embracing it. Um, and most of us that have been around for a while certainly have an understanding that despite the fear mongering that kind of occurs whenever there's a new technology or innovation, mm -hmm. progress actually creates more jobs in it than it eliminates. It just changes the nature of the work. And I could go on for a while on that, sure. but that, and the same thing's going to happen with generative AI. Okay, fair enough. Now, I work with companies to help them figure out how to integrate generative AI into their work. And one of my clients, I've just got off the phone with them and what they're thinking about in their accounting department. So they have three people who are working in the office and two people who are working remotely. And they are working to figure out how to autom automate their processes so that they can eliminate one of the remote workers. And the one that they will eliminate will be the one that figures that has the least amount of skills in working with AI. So they'll figure out which of those workers is most capable of working with AI and which is least capable of working with AI. And so I think the future, what I'm seeing from white clients, is that it's not generative AI that eliminates workers. It's going to be people who use generative AI who eliminate the work of those who don't use generative AI. What do you think about that? Um, I, well, I do... I do think there's going to be an element of that that occurs, mm -hmm. right? And partly because if you embrace innovation, you'll be more relevant. And that's the case, yeah. whether it's generative AI or anything else is how I see mm -hmm. it. Uh, you know, for being a very practical kind of thinker on this topic of, I'm going to say AI and automation, of which obviously generative AI is a subset. 
Sure. Um, a lot of companies, most companies will look at re-engineering their company based on, they'll take a process and say, can I automate it or put AI mm -hmm. on it? Yep. Kind of at that rudimentary level. Exactly. Which I understand that makes sense. You do that. But there's another cross cut that I look at even in my own company when I look at it, which is effectively you sort your payroll or your payment records in descending order of what you pay somebody to do the job you've asked them to do. Because anybody that's making less than about 50000 a year, they're probably for the most part processing tasks in a very structured process. Yeah. People between fifty and 100000 are making kind of if-then choices using structured data. So it's structured mm -hmm. decisioning and structured data. When you get to a hundred to 150,000 kind of annual comp, what they're doing is they're making some unstructured decisions with structured data. Above mm -hmm. 150, they're making unstructured judgmental decisions with unstructured data. Mm -hmm. And as you go up the stack, it takes longer to adopt AI because you got to tra train the AI on the data. So if you don't have the sure. data, you can't train the AI. And so that's kind of pragmatically how I think about it and how having companies mm -hmm. think about, can can you take somebody perhaps who maybe um, is not as ed experienced, et cetera, in terms of being able to do a job, and can you make them better and smarter so they can do a job they otherwise wouldn't have been able to do? Mm -hmm. So. Yes. That certainly makes sense to me. And that's exactly what's happening in the company that I'm talking about as an example of what they're doing. So those two workers, they're doing less, they're doing more task things. And the worker who will remain will be work with generative AI better and they will be paid better. They'll sure. be paid a higher salary than they were before. So yeah. I, can, I think that's part of the future. What do you think will happen with jobs that generative AI creates? So we're talking here about replacement and reduction of jobs. What about creation of jobs? What are you seeing and what uh, does your survey tell you about what independent professionals are anticipating about the creation of jobs? Because I'm definitely seeing that in terms of my clients of some jobs being created for using generative AI to bring better services to clients, to improve internal organizational efficiency. What are you seeing there? Yeah, so I'm going to, um, I'm going to, lay a couple of lenses on this. So one you mm -hmm. just touched on, which is the internal efficiency. And so when you're using generative AI to make your worse, your workforce more productive, yeah. you, you, and, and, and you can, okay, we are in our, in our organization. So, so just take a customer care function, mm -hmm. being able to look up unique contracts quickly and understanding the terms of the contract when you have high variability of contracts, Generative AI can do that because you basically have sta standing data. And instead of somebody going and looking at a standing document, they can just ask the question, what's the, you know, the discount rate on customer ABC? And you can get it immediately. That, mm -hmm. that type of thing. Um, and, but that's on kind of internal standing data. Then the second way to look at it is, well, can I turn that loose to my customers so that they could ask, what is the discount rate? Mm. Let generative AI answer that in a bot. Of course, the answer is yes, right? But all of that tends to be on standing data, what I'm talking about right now. Then the next lever is, can I do it on transactional data that's moving, mm. right? And when you do it on the transactional data that's moving, the opportunity to create a customer experience is so much greater. Mm -hmm. So you can create an enhanced customer experience. And this is what we've seen with innovation for, for decades. And when you create an experience that is better than the old experience, you create more demand for jobs than what there was before. Mm -hmm. So if, if you want, I, I'll give you an example to make it, and it's not generative AI, but it makes the point. In 2009, when Uber came out, the rideshare market in San Francisco, which was comprised of taxis and limousines was a hundred million dollar market. Five years later, it was a $300 million market. Hmm. There were more people driving and delivering people hmm. from point A to point B because of innovation and technology, hmm. including AI. Mm -hmm. So when the experience, which it always does, or usually does outstrips the efficiency, 
the demand outstrips the available supply to serve it. And that's what we've seen. And that's why in the country today, we have a human capital scarcity issue, not mm -hmm. too many people to do the jobs available to be done. And that's going to continue for several decades, in my opinion. Mm. Okay. Interesting. So thinking about independent workers, what can they do to position themselves best in this future world that will hopefully continue for the next several decades with the increasing use of generative AI? Employers are increasingly requesting these skills. What can independent workers do to position themselves effectively for this world? So um, a couple answers here on this one. One is just adopt a mindset of being curious and play with it. <laughs> like play with generative AI, right? Just like get out, test it, experience it, ask some questions, re-ask, like just kind of start to do some hands-on mm -hmm. curiosity learning. And then obviously the second one that uh, lever is to, to take some formal training on how to apply mm -hmm. generative AI and, mm -hmm. you know, get some actual concrete skills and certifications around it. Um, but I don't want to underestimate the value of playing with it. <laughs> it doesn't sound very sophisticated, but sometimes the way you learn the best is to use it in a way that you enjoy it. And then, then you can start to see the possible. And once you see the possible for your personal interest, then you can adopt it to your business is how it would be my way of encouraging independence. And it's free. Like you can go play with it for free. <laughs> sure. Interesting. What I, tell, I recommend my clients do is encourage their employees, whether they happen to be contractors or full-time employees, to experiment at the grassroots with generative AI and then bring best practices to the leadership and say, hey, I found that this works really well. What do you think? And then those can become incorporated into the company's AI playbook. So it sounds like you would want you incur you would encourage independents to do something like that, develop their own playbook by experimenting and figuring out what works for them. I, I absolutely do because when you start to play with it, the again I'm back to the experience. So it's kind of interesting. Arguably, and some people could disagree with me. Obviously, one of the greatest innovations in the history of anybody alive today was the smartphone. Mm -hmm. Yet very, very few people took a lesson on how to use the smartphone. They didn't mm -hmm. go get certifications or anything. It's because the experience was so great. They started playing with it. Next thing you know, you got a camera and then you got like, you know, you got your maps and you can get from point A to point B. And next thing you know, you're doing geofency for, for marketing. Mm -hmm. So, but that all started because people started to play with and love the experience of the iPhone mm -hmm. or whatever other smartphone they want to use. And so... I, we can't underestimate the value of curious learning. Hmm. Excellent. Well, as we finish up, are there any last words you wish to share with our audience? Well, the, the primary thing I, that I have here is, you know, it, just embrace the change instead of becoming fearful of it. Hmm. And that's a mindset uh, because if you become fearful of it or you try to avoid it or you take a protectionist mentality and say, it'll never affect how I do my job, et cetera, you're probably going to regret that decision. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you embrace it, you'll see the possible that you otherwise wouldn't see. So it's a mindset. And I would encourage people to embrace that curious learning I've talked about. Excellent. Thank you so much, Miles. Really appreciate you sharing your expertise. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Gleb. I appreciate being here today. And thank you to the audience for checking out another episode of the Wise Decision Maker Show. Please make sure to subscribe wherever you check out the show and leave a review. It helps others discover the show and it helps us improve the show.